the similarities really start with the fact, you know, how microbes want to exist in nature. You know, they don't want to be free floating in a test tube, how we look at them typically in the lab. They want to be attached to surfaces. They want to form these communities called biofilms. They secrete a bunch of extra polymeric substance, which essentially they're just building a home for themselves. And to your point, it, it's what makes them really hard to remove and treat. Public health. It's on everyone's mind these days, from hand washing to emerging pathogens. Welcome to Transmission Control, an infection prevention podcast focused on your appetite for trailblazing thought, discussion, and innovations that will help you make informed decisions. Each episode, we speak with public health experts and safety champions from across the globe as they share their experiences, passion, and opinions. From investigative journalism to medical publications, we tackle real-world barriers to halting the spread of disease. Whether you are tuning in for education, inspiration, or to hear the stories that need to be told, thank you for joining us. And now, get ready to blast off with your weekly injection of insight on transmission control. This week on Transmission Control, we are speaking with Joe Stoffel, specialist in microbiology with 3M Medical Solutions Division, and we're going to be talking about wound care, and this is a topic, Larry, that we haven't broached on this show in the past. We haven't really even alluded to it on any of the prior episodes, but in the Accountable Care Act, when patients go home, and if they were to go home with an infection, which wasn't one that they went into the hospital with, that actually impacts reimbursement and the profitability of the organization because the hospital is then responsible for taking care financially of the patient and any care that's related to that infection. And sometimes those infections are related to, you know, surgical site infections or maybe a bed sore. Right, bed sore, decubitus ulcer. And so those things are the responsibility of the hospital when the patient goes home. And so I think in the past, the acute care setting might not have been, I'm sure, always aware of wound care, but a lot of this happens in the home. And so what I love for all of our hospital-based infection preventionists out there is, is really raising the awareness of this because it really does tie to the acute care setting when it comes to the the new financial model in the business of healthcare moving forward since about 2012. Right, right. So I'm going to pick our guest's brain to get an understanding of what are the primary causes of wounds that won't heal, what we call these chronic wounds as opposed to acute wounds. And what are the type of organisms that might be responsible for this? And risk factors, for example, we're all familiar with diabetes interfering with blood supply and causing wounds not to heal. But there are a number of other risk factors, age, smoking. We'll talk about each of them and, and get into them and and, and get in them in, into them in detail and maybe talk a little bit about why high blood sugar levels would interfere with wound, wound healing. That is not obvious to me, and I'm interested to learn that and to also get an understanding of what are the mechanisms that we can employ to help speed along these chronic wounds. Of course, chronic wounds are important, but we have to most importantly learn not only just what they are, but how are we going to resolve them? How are we going to solve them? How are we going to cause a chronic wound to kind of morph into what we might view as more of a treatable acute wound where it then can heal rather quickly? So we'll talk about all of these, and I think the listener will find this a most interesting discussion. All right, we're going to be right back after a short break with Joe Stoffel, specialist in microbiology at 3M Medical Solutions Division. I'm Justin Poulin. And I'm Dr. Lawrence Muscarella. From 17 Studios, let's get into it. This is Transmission Control. We are speaking with Joe Stoffel, specialist of microbiology for 3M Medical Solutions Division. And Joe, I know you've done a lot of work with our sister podcast, Beyond Clean, but we're going to be talking to the infection prevention audience here on Transmission Control today. And specifically around the microbiology of wound care and bringing the science of microbiology to the clinicians on the front line. So welcome to our show. Thanks so much for coming on. Thanks for having me. Excited to be here. So Joe, why don't you talk a little bit about 
your background in the industry and, you know, how you find yourself where you're at in your career today. Sure. You know, I've been at 3M now about 20 years. I've had a kind of a brief stint in drug delivery systems, a little bit of work in diagnostics, but primarily focusing in the area of antimicrobials from a wound care standpoint or infection prevention as well. With about the last 10 years or more, really focusing heavily in the area of biofilm. So with biofilm, we talk about biofilm and medical instruments. We talk about them forming on medical instruments being difficult to clean and then, of course, problems with disinfection and sterilization. Is there kind of a direct analogy there between biofilms forming in devices and posing problems? And, for example, biofilm forming in a wound, if that's fair to say. And I'm, I'm not too knowledgeable in, in wounds. So maybe you can discuss that with the audience a bit. But, for example, when we look at acute versus chronic wounds, particularly focusing on chronic wounds, is there an issue of biofilms playing in there that can be difficult to not so much remove, but maybe to treat with an antibiotic? Yeah, this, the similarities really start with the fact, you know, how microbes want to exist in nature. You know, they don't want to be free floating in a test tube, how we look at them typically in the lab. They want to be attached to surfaces. They want to form these communities called biofilms. They secrete a bunch of extra polymeric substance, which essentially they're just building a home for themselves. And to your point, it, it's what makes them really hard to remove and treat, especially in the world of wound care. You know, they can get into the, the nooks and crannies of a, of a wound, you know, chronic wounds, especially. You know, they're not smooth, flat surfaces like you might find on a device. So the, the microbes kind of have an, an advantage there of finding these niches and really setting up shop. Is it fair to say, or probably not fair to say, that a biofilm is present in every type of chronic wound? And maybe before you answer that, can you explain to us really what are the primary types of wounds for the audience? It's acute and chronic, but can you describe that a little bit and then vis-a-vis -vis chronic, talk a little bit about the presence or not thereof of biofilms? Yeah, sure. So, you know, if you're going to go in and get surgery or, you know, you have an accident, you know, at home or something and you're going in, you're, you have what we would call an acute wound, something that's nine ninety five percent of the time is going to go on and heal just fine. You know, with maybe just taking an oral antibiotic or even just using, you know, your topical, what you have in your medicine cabinet at home. What we typically call a chronic wound is anything that has not healed or progressed past four weeks. And that may be a surgical incision or, you know, that injury that you had at home and it just will not progress into healing. But a lot of times what we find these chronic wounds is in our older population, our diabetic population, people that suffer from venous insufficiency, and also people who are in that immunocompromised standpoint, you know, so we, people who's just healing capability has been sort of compromised to some degree. And those wounds just will hang out, like I said, at the front end four weeks, but clinicians will see people come in that have had a wound exist for more than years. You know, one of my favorite doctors that I've worked with said they had this woman come in and she's had a wound on her foot for two years and just lived with it. Uh, okay. That's kind of counterintuitive for me. So they have a wound on their foot and you mentioned a few, maybe we can talk about a few more kind of risk factors for why rather than like with an acute wound, we can expect it, correct me if I'm wrong, to kind of heal within a reasonable time. You do see people sometimes with these chronic wounds and you mentioned a few of the risk factors of the contributors, but I'm curious about, let's talk about, for example, diabetes. You mentioned that. Why would diabetes for the layman and someone with no knowledge about this, why would diabetes and maybe a high blood glucose level, why would that cause any kind of a problem? Why would that affect the way a, a wound healed? Yeah, so people who have, you know, kind of out of control glucose levels, you, you, you know, you do find them that they do become more susceptible to infection. And I think that's directly correlated with sort of a suppression of the immune system. People who have chronic diabetes, they suffer, you know, neuropathies. So for example, that foot, wound that you might have, they might have something as simple as a rock in their shoe and they're walking around on it and they don't even realize it. And eventually that's just going to wear a hole in their foot. But also people who suffer from diabetes, you know, they get hardening of the veins and the arteries, which decreases blood flow, which then just kind of makes that skin a lot more susceptible if it's not getting the oxygen, the nutrients that it needs. So they're walking at the supermarket, they bang their ankle on the edge of a cart 
creates a tear in the skin and they don't have the blood flow there to go ahead and complete the healing appropriately. What is that mechanism by which glucose would then damage a blood vessel? How exactly is that happening? You know, that that I really don't know. I would have to pass you off on to uh, an endocrinologist that probably would know that answer a lot better than me. Okay, well, what about some of the other risk factors? For example, you're saying smoking. I mean, I understand why a suppressed immune system would obviously contribute to a wound not healing, but smoking maybe is not so obvious to me. And then maybe we can talk about the infection and whether the wounds that don't heal, are there specific organisms that cause a wound to heal slower than others? And maybe even back up from that, what organisms are we really talking about here? What kind of microorganisms and bacteria are typically found over and over again in a chronic wound? Well, that's a really interesting point to make is what are we finding? And of course, what we're going to find is what's most culturable. So we're going to find a lot of staphs, a lot of pseudomonas, some streptococci, enterococci, because they're very easily, you know, when you take a culture swab or a biopsy, you can grow those up in the lab pretty readily. But not every lab is set up to say, look for anaerobes. So if, if you do have the ability to culture for anaerobes, you're going to find some bacteroides, you're going to find clostridia, you know, things like that. And I think that's largely why there's a push these days from consensus documents to go to more of a molecular approach where you can just find anything and everything and get a full library of what may be there. And the reality is, is you may have a couple logs of a, the coagulase negative staph and, and your body might just be able to shrug that off. We don't care, but maybe lurking in the background is a non-culturable organism or fungi that's really causing all the issues and that chronic inflammation. And you said non-culturable, I think is the word. Is that what you said? Yeah, not yeah, non-culturable. So, so then that brings us kind of into this situation where is there really, can you discuss the value or not of sampling the wound? So if we have a chronic wound, do all hospitals or healthcare practitioners then, is it routine practice per maybe a consensus you were talking about earlier? Do we sample the wound and determine what the specific organisms are? Then we identify the organisms, maybe some genome analysis of them, whole genome sequencing, and then that tells us what the organism is, and then we do an antibiotic susceptibility testing. Is that routine? Is that always done in treating chronic wounds, or is that the exception rather than the rule? It's kind of a yes and a no. There's going to be institutions where that absolutely will be part of their standard of care, and it might be that the head of that institution really believes in it, finds value in it, and they drive you know, that, that forward. It might be because maybe that institution has access to a microbiology, a clinical microbiology lab, you know, within the institution, or maybe there's a contract facility that's really close nearby. Most facilities don't have that opportunity. So now they're talking about taking this culture. They're going to put it in the mail. They're going to ship it off. Maybe they get the results, you know, three, four, five days later. And then it can be kind of hard to find the value well, it's five days later, that result is from five days ago, but now what's the wound doing today? So it can kind of create this cycle of, okay, what's the value of this? It'd be great if we did have more opportunity to include that in a standard of care, because ultimately we want to bring more science. We want to bring more relevant information to the clinician so they can make the appropriate wound care choices. And the microbiology is a huge part of that. Unfortunately, it's just the reality that a lot of places, if not the majority of places that are providing this wound care, it's just not an option. So that's interesting. I would not have, I would not have thought that. Thank you for that clarification and, and for explaining to me what might or might not be routine protocol because intuitively I would, thought, I would think that you absolutely would do that if for no other reason than this. It's something we talk about often and we read in the press about the development of antibiotic-resistant and emerging organisms, superbugs, for example. So if we're not sampling the wounds, we're not determining what the culprit is, and we kind of in a shotgun approach are treating the patient with antibiotics, antibiotics that aren't necessarily directed for this specific organism that's causing the infection because we didn't sample, we don't know what organism is causing the infection, Aren't we kind of adding to the antibiotic problem or is, is this a misnomer? Am I way off base? 
No, it, it's possible. And I guess it just always comes again back down to the level of, of knowledge and what that clinician and how they treat their patients. I think for the vast majority of them, if they're really concerned about an infection or, you know, a microbial contamination in the wound, they're going to take the culture. They're going to find out what is there, get antibiotic susceptibilities. And then from an oral standpoint, they're going to prescribe what they believe the blessed course of action to be from an antibiotic. Typically, what they're going to do as an adjunct to that, though, is a topical, addressing a cream, an ointment, of a, or they're going to debride, or do maybe do a surgical debridement to remove that biofilm or the microbial contamination. But what you're seeing is a lot of use of things like silvers, povidone iodines, Dakin solution, which is a dilute bleach. So a lot of broad spectrum antimicrobials that you're not really terribly concerned about resistance from because of their mechanism of action. They're just, they're hitting the cells, they're blowing them open. So when I have an infection that isn't chronic yet, might become chronic, and for any of the listeners who probably, like all of us, have been in this situation, we go to the medicine cabinet sometimes, you know, we see that skin wound and maybe it's just not healing, and we get that topical ointment. Maybe we buy it from the local pharmacy so it's not prescription grade, or maybe we have our physician call in a cream. Do these creams or ointments really work? Are they more kind of cosmetic where they're to appease and assuage the patient's concern? Do these ointments really work? Or, and it's kind of a two-point two question, do we then sometimes do have to go to debridement? And could you explain what debridement is? But let's get to that in a second. What about the these ointments? Do they really work or, or are they more cosmetic? Yeah, you see your first aid antimicrobial ointments that you're going to find. And the answer is, unfortunately, it's going to be, a, it's a big depends. What we do see typically is a lot of the organisms that we find, say, in soil, you know, that maybe you're, that scrape is going to get in there, contain a lot of antibiotic resistance genes and the antibiotics that you typically find in those triple antibiotic, you know, like a polymyxin, bacitracin, those things type. Uh, those organisms are going to be resistant to those antimicrobials. However, not all of them are. So it's, like I said, it's a yes and a no. They are going to provide some benefit. I think for most people is when you're dealing with an acute injury, your best line of defense is going to be your own host immune system. So if you can just tilt the balance in favor of your own host immune system a little bit, and maybe that first aid ointment helps do that so you can attack that maybe that contamination from inside and from outside, there definitely is a benefit there. For me, another additional benefit of that first aid ointment is moist wound healing. It's typically like a petrolatum based or a cream based ointment. You can put that on your cut, you cover it with your, your bandage, and then you're keeping that nice and moist. So then that is a preferable way to heal a wound as well. So that then reminds me when I was a child with wounds, I was given kind of confusing advice, which you're kind of hitting on the nail on the head. Do I want that wound to be moist and be covered? Or what about when the doctor says, uncover it, it needs to breathe to heal? What, what's kind of going on there? I subscribe to the idea of moist wound healing is, is the best way to go. It's going to heal a lot faster. And a, a good colleague of mine kind of explained it the best way. If you think about that scab, essentially, when you let it breathe, that's going to form. you got that hard crust that forms down in the divot. The body now has to kind of come in and eat and push that out of the way. So then, you know, your keratinocytes and your other tissues can kind of migrate in and then fill that space. If you go to moist wound healing and you don't have that scab there, now the body doesn't have to do double duty of like removing the scab and now migrating in it can just go ahead and migrate straight in. And you're going to get better quality healing, probably less scarring if you go the moist wound healing route. So it, it really just comes, I think it's a generational thing. And you do, do still see that in hospitals and wound care clinics where people will just kind of do the wet to dry method. You really don't want a wound to dry out. And what about the impact of oxygen on the healing process? If it's kind of covered and it's wet, if you will, is it harder for the wound then to quote unquote breathe? Can it, what is the importance of breathing at all? Is there any? 
from my standpoint, any relevant oxygen that's going to be there, and if you're a healthy individual, you're going to be providing from the inside out. It's going to be coming from your blood. Not from the system. outside you're in. Going- okay. Correct. Now, if you have, you know, and this takes us into a completely different area, but if you're someone with venous insufficiency or, you know, some sort of those diseases where you don't have appropriate blood flow, then we see things like hyperbaric oxygen therapy. So we have that enriched oxygen environment to help essentially push oxygen into those areas. But that's really only beneficial if you cannot supply that oxygen from the inside out first. So that inside out model then requires that there not be peripheral vascular disease, that there be adequate tissue perfusion, because if from the inside out model, we have to have now, instead of the environment maybe providing the air, and correct me if my model is completely off base, but instead of having the oxygen from the environment then helping the wound healing, we need oxygen from the blood, as I'm following what I think I understand you to say. And so we need very good tissue perfusion, bring the oxygen into the wound, and then it can heal. And if we don't have that, we then start getting into this chronic wound scenario. Is that kind of a, a, a fair wrap-up of what, what's going on here? Yeah, and that ties together exactly what you were asking earlier about debridement, like why do we debride? Yeah, what is debridement? I read about it. I kind of understand. But for those listeners that don't, what is irrigation and debridement? Why do we do it? What, what, what is it? And, and how are we benefiting from it? Yeah, so debridement comes in kind of a couple levels. So at your real basic level, essentially, it's a really aggressive cleaning. So if you think about maybe a a scrape that you've had and it's got kind of sloughy and you've got maybe some skin that's hanging around, well, that skin's going to die, but maybe it's still attached. A debridement would be essentially going in and removing any material that's not viable. You want to get rid of it. So, you know, maybe at the most basic level, like I said, you can just scrub it away. And next level up, you would want to perform maybe what we call a sharps debridement. So that would be using a scalpel or a curette or any other type of instrument to go ahead and actually scrape, cut, and remove that tissue away. And, you know, if you're a wound care clinician that does a lot of this, you know, the sort of their mantra is debreed until you bleed. The idea is to essentially to make that chronic wound that is maybe kind of clogged with slough and necrotic tissue, get rid of it and make it in an acute wound that's very well perfused. So now that it can heal more like in an acute wound. So debridement then, two step, correct me if I'm wrong. The first one is you're doing a cleansing, you're getting rid of necrotic tissue. And then two, you may even be trying and doing that. You want to get to those vessels so that back to your working from the inside out, when you get bleeding, you're now bringing, while there's the downside of bleeding, the upside is you're bringing oxygen right to the site of the problem. Is is that, is that fair? Yeah. And, you know, and kind of the same with, I made the analogy with the scab, you know, anything that's not going to be there permanently just becomes an impediment. You don't want it there to be in the way. So if you have dead tissue, if you have like the necrosis, the slough, you want it out of the way so the good stuff can come in and take its place. And an, an ulcer. Can you tell me, sometimes I see people walking in the street, you know, in shorts, and maybe they have one of those white bands on their feet, which now is making sense to me that maybe the blood circulation is not so great. And I see a wound, and then maybe I see them again a couple of weeks later, and they have that same wound. What exactly is an ulcer? Are all ulcers chronic wounds? Are all chronic wounds ulcers? What What is that? Other than the ulcer, of course, from the one we're all familiar with in the, in the stomach, with po- possibly caused by bacteria, What what is a wound ulcer? Yeah, I, I think from a real basic level, we would consider an ulcer to be any breach in the normal tissue. So here we're talking about, you know, our number one defense to the world, our skin. We have a breach in the skin, so whether if it's a scrape, a cut, or whatever, technically that's an ulceration of the skin. Okay. And then from a chronic standpoint, it's one that just does not progress. Okay. So as we start to wind some things down, I think this has been really educational. You've taught me a lot, and I'm sure you've taught the listeners quite a bit. Could we summarize again? We touched on some of them, but could we summarize maybe what the primary causes of these wounds that do not heal, and maybe briefly the mitigation for that. How can we compensate for that? So for example, I'll I'll start 
this exercise out. So smoking, that's going to interfere with wound healing. Okay, so what, what should we do to correct for that? We should stop smoking. Maybe immune suppress system, we maybe get a healthier immune system and immune response. So those are two. Can you list for us, age ties into that poor nutrition, but anything else coming to mind in particular? What about, for example, the location of the wound? Is the extent to which a wound might be hard to heal or won't heal at all at all or difficult to heal requiring, for example, debridement? Is there a the location on the body where this is particularly problematic, some wounds heal faster on these limbs, but not on those limbs. What about the site, anatomically speaking, in terms of how this contributes to a wound healing or not healing? Yeah, and it's really going to be dependent on the patient and, and sort of their lifestyle. So again, if we if we talk about the the neuropathic foot, you know, someone is still mobile, they're going to be walking around, they sort of take the risk of, you know, creating that ulcer, not knowing it's there and then walking around it on for days or weeks before someone finally realizes that they've had it. If we think about, you know, someone who is a paraplegic or a quadriplegic and they're ridden to a a wheelchair and they're sitting on their tailbones, you know, for essentially all the time and they end up with those pressure ulcers on their hips, on their tailbones, you know, very, very difficult to heal because of the person's lifestyle and what they're relegated to. I think anything that's probably on an extremity is probably going to be very difficult to heal, especially when we're talking about below the knee, just because gravity is not working in our favor. We all know as we age, our veins, you know, we have those valves in our, in our large veins that kind of make sure the blood is always moving up towards the heart. Those start to fail as we get older and, you know, and you kind of talked about that person walking around with those bandages, hopefully it's a, comp- a compression wrap, a compression that helps kind of squeeze that lymph and that fluid in the blood, get it back out of the system to take the pressure that that skin is feeling from the distension. So those can be very difficult to heal too. And then it, again, it just really comes down to how many comorbidities are you living with? You know, what is your nutritional stat, you know, nutritional status, you know, are you a smoker? Also, where you live and do you have access to regular health care? Do you have someone that can help care for you if you need help? Again, a lot of these people are older. Maybe a loved one has passed away and now they're left to do their wound care on their own. That can be very difficult to just treat. And it may be a simple wound, but just maybe really difficult for that person to take care of on their own. It's really a complicated you know, field and, you know, like anybody who goes into chronic wound care, you know, I really tip my hat to them because it's, it really is kind of a, like a community service that we're doing for these people. Wow. So this has been just, this has been a great interview. I, I think you've really answered some of my questions really well and really thoroughly. And one last one I have before we end, and then I'd like to hear if there's anything more you'd like to talk about or any brief story that you'd like to tell or anything else you'd like to ask us or you'd like to, to talk about before we finish here. You talked earlier about kind of the pressure ulcer. Is that what a bed sore is? Are they the same thing? Essentially, yes. Yep. Okay. So anything else you would like to talk about or any kind of story you'd like to tell or maybe where you would like wound healing to go in the future? What is one of the Achilles heel or a missing piece now that you would like to see filled in the coming weeks? but probably more months and, and years in terms of surgical wound care. What 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 is on your mind and what are your thoughts about where we need to go? And assuming we're somewhere now that is not sufficient and, and we need to improve, what, what would you like to see optimized? Man, as, as I mentioned, you know, I did a brief stint in diagnostics and that was specifically geared to try and come up with diagnostics for wound care. You know, looking for biomarker measures within wounds to kind of give us a state of, is it, it, you know, be ahead of the curve? Is it regressing or is it improving rather than just measuring the size of the wound to find out if it's improving or regressing? So I think anything we can do to bring clinicians more hard science, more better metrics would be really, really valuable. You know, we do a really great job with blood chemistries. They do a good job with, you know, getting blood pressures, Dopplers to find out where blood flow is. Uh, and there's a lot of things we can do to essentially move towards a, a treatment or a therapy based on those measures. But when we go directly into the base of that wound, other than maybe taking a biopsy or a, a swab to send it off for what the microbial biome is, right. 
Makes sense. We to me. really don't know from a biomarker, you know, like what is the protease levels? You know, what, what is the state of the, of the cells that are moving in? Are, you know, are they heading in the right direction? Is this inhospitable? There's some treatments, you know, like if we're going to put a graft in that wound, you'd really like to know that that graft is going to take. And if your pro- proteases and inflammation are out of control, it's probably not going to take. And it would be great to have that information first. So you're saying there's a lot of research and development still to do. Okay. Well, that's really, really helpful. Very good stuff. And I, I really appreciate all that you shared with us today. Yeah, my pleasure. That was Joe Stoffel, specialist in microbiology with 3M Medical Solutions Division. And Larry, you really walked through wound care, kind of A to Z, really nicely with Joe during this discussion. I mean, I, I know I didn't chime in with any questions, but you were really having a nice flow of the conversation there. Having worked in home health and hospice, I had done a lot in the late 90s and early 2000s with wound care in home. And so a lot of those concepts like debridement and, and, uh, you know, hyperbaric treatments and all of that, I'm, I'm quite familiar with. And I really like how you make, sh- made sure that we defined what those meant because not everybody who listens to this podcast is necessarily going to have a background in nursing or even a background in wound care whatsoever. And this really gave a, a not just a, a good overview, not just high level, but I'd say a pretty detailed overview, even though we covered a pretty broad span of wound care. So great job by Joe, but also by you, Larry, to make sure that we really define the concepts that are integral to, to wound care in, in healthcare. Yes. Yeah. Thank you for that. I think that the interview did flow well. and We did cover a lot in the short period of time and got into some of the A, Bs, and Cs of wound care. The issue of biofilms in wound care is also fascinating because we talk often of biofilms forming on the internal channels of reusable medical instruments and the difficulty removing those biofilms and how that can result in disease transmission. And you know, there's some similarities between the biofilm forming on an instrument and the biofilms forming on a wound. And I had never considered that really before until he started enlightening us. So I think it was a really good interview. And I, 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 I'm sure that the listeners will, will really appreciate it and probably play it a couple times. All right. Well, that's going to do it for this week's show. But as a reminder, you can help support Transmission Control by subscribing on Apple, Amazon, or Google Podcasts, as well as Stitcher, iHeartRadio, Spotify, or on your favorite podcast application. You can access bonus content for certain episodes, but you've got to download our smartphone app for iPhone and Android. And while you're there, we'd certainly appreciate a rating and a review because your feedback is important to us here at the show. On behalf of Larry and myself, thank you for listening to this week's episode of Transmission Control. Control.